strength back, Father God. Father, I pray that you as a pastor, Lord, I pray that you give him the unction and blood to be able to preach with all clarity and compassion. Lord, give him the liberty to be able to preach the way you want him to preach. For all these things, Father God, we ask this in your son's precious name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right, John chapter 1. I'm looking at one verse, and it's very simple to find. Let's get to John chapter 1, and we're going to do a study for Sunday school. Brother Paul is going to have the afternoon service. We're going to take time to study in Sunday school this thought of considering Christ the Word of God. One verse. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Our Father, I thank you for the day. Thank you for the Sunday school hour. And Lord, I pray that during this Sunday school hour that we'd learn, we'd listen, and we'd fall more in love with our Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. So, who would tell me, what is a Word? What is a Word? For he says, in the beginning was the word. Does anybody have any idea what a word is? I mean, we say, he's the word. What is a word? A thought. Huh? A thought. A thought put into verbal, verbality or verbal. It is a word. It's a thought. A word is a form by which a person expresses his heart and himself verbally. Out in bunch of the heart, the mouth speaking. You give words to what you think. And uh, our words exp express our heart. Our words express our heart. What we say a lot of times comes out of what we think. And I'm not saying that every time you utter some out of word, that that's your deep down thought. I'm saying that what you talk about as a rule, all right, if you talk about um, football as a rule, I know where your heart's at. If you talk about, you know, uh, the coming of the Lord as a rule, whoo, I know where your heart's at. What is a word? A word is what expresses uh, verbally what is in your heart. The Bible tells us in the book of Matthew chapter 12 in some verses that we're very familiar with, he makes this statement, O generation of vipers, how can ye be an evil speak good things? For out of the month of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say to you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give a half count thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. You and I need to watch what we say. Take your thoughts captive to the authority of Christ. Bring every thought into captivity. Watch what we say. And that is why God warns us to keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. Proverbs 4 Verse 23 tells us that. Verse 24 says, Put away from thee a forward mouth, and for her slips, put far from thee. You'll notice how he tied verse 24 to 23. 23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Verse 24 says, Put away from thee a forward mouth, and for her verse slips, put far from thee. Man looketh on the outward appearance. The Lord looketh on the heart. Now that uh, is, uh, is so eloquently said by many is probably one of the most 
foolish things that people try to use to justify sinfulness. Well, God looks on the heart. Well, they never read out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speak. Because if they'd have read that, they'd say, God looked on the heart, and what comes out of the heart is what I produce. A, a, a good tree has good roots and produces good fruit. An evil tree produces evil fruit because it has evil root. So keep thy heart with all diligence. Words. Words. God warned us about words. Words show us our cares. Proverbs 25 and verse number 11. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. Apples of gold in pictures of silver. God wants you to understand that we need to be careful about how we speak, what we speak. Do you speak it with a heart of compassion? Or a heart of condemnation. You can say the same thing. With the wrong heart. So he says a word fitly spoken. At the right time. With the right attitude. And the right words. Are what we need to have. Matter of fact. Our words. Should be and can be conformed. And corrected. By the grace of God working on our heart. You want to know how to speak right? Here's what I here's a verse I pray often. In Isaiah chapter 50, in verse number four, he makes this statement. The Lord has given me the tongue to learn that I should know how to speak a word in season to them that or to him that is weary. He waked in the morning my morning. He waked my ear to hear as to learn. So he, he tells us that if we want to speak words of wisdom, words of comfort, words of grace, a word in season for the weary, what do we need to do? We need to ask God, God, give me the tongue of the learner that I may know how to speak a word in season to them that are or to him that is weary. Have you ever been somewhere and you just felt like I got to say something? And you just felt like, what, do I, what am I supposed to say? And uh, I, I remember distinctly a friend of mine who told another friend of mine when this one friend, they had their fourth miscarriage, I mean it was a it was a bad thing, the baby had already heard the heartbeat and everything, then they had a miscarriage, and when this miscarriage came, this friend of mine, this other friend of mine tells him, he says oh, y'all are young y'all don't have time to have a penny and I'm thinking to myself who told him that? I just asked God, give me the tongue to learn that I don't have to speak a word in season, then they're weary and guess what God did? He said, just weep with them that weep. Sometimes you don't have a word to say. Sometimes it's better to say nothing than say something stupid. Amen. Let me say, some people say they're trying to be spiritual. I tell them, there's another S word that I'm thinking of when you said that. And I said, and it rhymes with you. It is not spiritual. And uh, they, they get kind of frustrated with me because I did not guard my words. And sometimes I need to guard my word. So I want to consider Christ, the word of God, for just a little while and see if it will help us a little bit this morning. Consider Christ, the word of God. I said that words are the expression of our heart verbally. Well, Christ is the express image of of God's person. He is the outward expression of what God, the invisible God that we cannot see, expressed himself in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the glory of God in flesh. For in him was all the 
fullness of the Godhead bodily. Christ is, and I'm going to use our verse right here, John chapter 1, verse number 1, and show you that Christ is, number 1, the word of revelation. Number 2, he is the word of regeneration. And number 3, he is the word for reception. He is the word of revelation. He reveals God. And we will see this in the three parts of verse number one. Number one, we will see the witness of the word. W-H-E-N. N-E-S-S. -E -S. You said that's not a word. It is a word because I just expressed myself and you understood what I said. When was the word? When did it happen? The witness of the word. And the Bible tells us in the beginning. You'll notice it does not say from the beginning. But in the beginning. When everything started, it was already there. He was already there. Now, the Jehovah's Witnesses want to say, well, he was a created being. As a man, he was created. But God had created the womb. Jesus had created the womb that had given him birth. If all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made, that was made. He is before all things, and by him all things consist. He is before himself. Because when he became a thing, he had already existed. Now they want to go to Proverbs, I think it's chapter 8, I believe, where it talks about wisdom and personifies wisdom. And he is our wisdom. But can I say, when God personifies wisdom, he is dealing with the personification of a, an attribute. Not of a person. Jesus has always existed. In, in, in the beginning, he was there. In John chapter 17. In John chapter 17. In verse number 24, he makes this statement. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. He was before the foundation of the world. Verse number five of that same chapter. Oh, now, Father, glorify me, thou me, with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Before he, before the world was, he was. Before Abraham was, I am. This is the I am who has always existed in the beginning or was the word. In Colossians, in the book of Colossians, chapter 1, we will find again this description of him. And he says, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, principalities or powers, all things created by him and for him. And let me say, you want to know who he is? And he is the head of the body, the church. That is Jesus Christ. He's the head of the body. And so, he is God because God created all things. And by him were all things created that were in heaven and in earth. So you find something that was created in heaven, he's before that. People want to say, well, yeah, he's, he was before things that were created on earth. According to that verse, he was created before all things that were created in heaven. And let me say that word all, now y'all might not believe this, means all. You say, well, that, that, well, everybody knows that. Okay. 
Then why is there ever a debate over whether he created everything? He's always been. Hebrews 13, verse number 8, he makes this statement. Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. The book of the Revelation, chapter 1, verse number 8. So you're beating a dead horse. Uh, let me say, the dead horse, it doesn't bother the dead horse if you beat it. Amen. So if it's bothering you, it's probably because it's stirring something up in you, saying, I, won't, I don't even, I don't want to hear about all this stuff if I'm smarter than you. If you're smarter than me, let me enjoy the fact that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the everlasting Father. Hallelujah. He's God. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. He is the eternal God. He is the Almighty. In the beginning was the Word. Right. Oh, Hebrews 57. Uh, I believe it is. Or not Hebrews 57. Wow. There's, I, I added some chapters to Hebrews, didn't I? Yes, yes I did. That's a bunch of chapters I added to Hebrews. Isaiah 57, uh, verse 15, he makes it, this statement this way, and I'm turning over there, I could probably quote it, but it says, For thus saith the high and lofty one that happens in eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also as a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and revive the heart of the contrite ones. He dwells in and inhabits eternity. From everlasting to everlasting, he is God. That is the witness of the word. He is the revelation of God. The word is the revelation of God. And then there we find the awareness of the word. And again, we're in our chapter. He makes the next statement. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. Not only of when he existed, but where he exists from everlasting to everlasting. With God. Verse number 18 of our chapter tells us, he says, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Father, which is in the bosom of the Father, he had declared him. Now here he is on earth. At the same time, he's in the bosom of the Father. I can't explain that. I just know it to be a fact, and I enjoy that fact. That Jesus Christ, the awareness of him, he is with the Father. He is with the Father. At this point in time, at this moment, he is with God. At the moment he was on earth, he was with God. At the moment of creation, he was with God. Before ever there was a creation, he was with God. He was the word, was with God. It was in his heart. And out of the bunch of the heart, God spoke. And what did he speak by? The word. The word. Matter of fact, his words all bring us to see the word. For Jeremiah makes it, says it this way. Um, no, he doesn't. I, I would tell it to you, but I can't remember it now. Uh, and he, but he talks about, I, thy words were found, that's what he said, and I did eat them, the word. And thy word, singular, was unto me the joy and rejoice in my heart, for I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. The words get, our, get us into the word. Jesus says, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. The words testify of the word. Where is the word? Is with God. Chapter 16, verse number 28 of John. He makes the statement this way. I came forth from the Father, and I'm coming to the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. That's where I spend my time. 
I live in the presence of the Most High. He's seated at the right hand of the Majesty on high. On the right hand of the Majesty on high. I mean, He's there, ever living, to make intercession for us. The awareness of the Word. We ought to be aware of where He was, where He is, and where He will always be. For I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord which is and which was the Almighty. I already mentioned that verse. But over in 1 John chapter 1, verse number 2, For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness to showing you that, that eternal life which was with the Father and manifested unto us. So we find the witness of the Word. Winding was the Word. We find the awareness of the Word. And then we find the thinness of the word, which is, and the word was God. Now, the Jehovah's Witnesses, and uh, I am not mocking them, so I am not just saying the Jehovah's False Witnesses. But they do not have the truth. They do not know the truth. They do not, or do they, they refuse to believe the truth. The Jehovah's Witnesses say that. That in that in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, that there's a little tick there that means he it was a God. Therefore, there's two God that are exactly the same, for he's the express image of the person of God. Or as their uh, bad translation says, he is the exact representation of deity. Exactly. And I ask them every time. I say, how can you be exactly like God, Jehovah God, and not be Jehovah God? I said, I mean, exactly. I said, not one jot or tittle is off. I mean, it is, it is not, there's no room for error to be exact. And they say, well, 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 well. I said, I can tell you how. To be him. I and my father are one. In the book of Psalm chapter 90 and verse number 2. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever there has formed the earth and the world. Even from everlasting to everlasting. Thou art God. Who's he talking about there? He's talking about Jesus. That was in our dwelling place. I want you to understand that God compares himself with the Old Testament with the New Testament. In the book of Zechariah, the book of Zechariah, which we can come to right close to the end of the Old Testament, and you come to the book of Zechariah, chapter 12. In verse number 10. I, I'm just going to show you if they're the same person. He says. And I will pour upon the house of David. And upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem. In the spirit of grace and supplication. And they shall look upon me. Whom they have pierced. Hmm. And they shall mourn for him. As one mourned for his only son. And shall be in bitterness for him. As one that is in bitterness. For his firstborn. Now. What does he tell us. In John 19, in verse number 37, they looked upon him and whom they pierced. That is what he's dealing with there. And uh, they shall look upon him or on him whom they pierced. That's what the scripture says. Where does it say that at? It says it in Zechariah chapter 12, in verse number 10. Jesus is the same one. And so, if we're going to look at his revelation of himself, he reveals himself as God, um, we find in the, we'll just look at the Gospel of John pretty much so. I, I could go a few other places. But in the Gospel of John, he is the shining forth of God. In chapter 1, verse number 4, in him was life, 
and the light was the light. For it shining forth. What shined forth from the Father is light. In him was the light of men. Verse number 9 of that same chapter. That was a true light which lighted every man which comes into the world. Speaking of Jesus Christ. He's the light and shining forth of the Father. Chapter 8, verse number 12. I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. John 8, 12. John 9, and verse number 5. Again, we will find this truth, that he is the shining forth. And as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus Christ is the shining forth of the Father. The shining forth of God. The Word was God. But not only do I find Him the shining forth of God, but He is the shepherding God. The shepherding God. And we know this, and uh, in chapter 10, in verse number 11, He makes it this way. I am the good shepherd. Now who is our shepherd? The Lord is my shepherd. And I shall not want. Who's the good shepherd? God. But Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Not a good shepherd. The good shepherd. Matter of fact, if we look at Peter, we would find him as a chief shepherd in uh, 1 Peter 5, 4. Return to the chief the shepherd and bishop of your souls. The chief shepherd. And in, in Hebrews 13, in verse 20, we will find him as the great shepherd. For we know that he is, if God is the shepherd, our shepherd, and Jesus is that shepherd. He is the shepherd in God. He reveals himself to us. Not only do I find that he is the shining forth of God and the shepherd in God, but I can find in this same chapter, chapter 10, that he is the sovereign God himself. Verse number 30, he makes a very declarative statement. I and my father are one. And if you look at it, you'll notice right after that is not two words like in purpose or in essence or similar. No. There is a period. I and my father are one. Period. There is no are no ifs and or buts about it. If you believe your King James Bible as it is written, I and my father are one. He is the sovereign God. The person. The person of the sovereign God. Chapter 14, just to reiterate this. In verse 11, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Believe me. Just believe me. I am in the person of God and God is in the person of me. I and my Father are one. And he's not only the person, but he is the presence of the Most High. Chapter 12, verse number 45, I think it is. And he said, he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. Who sent him? Ah, the Father had sent him. For God sent his Son into the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. God sent his son to the world we might live through him. I mean, there's all, it's all throughout the, the whole gospel that God's the one who saved. And Jesus tells them, He that has seeth me, seeth him that sent me. He is the presence of God. You say, Preacher, why are you letting us know this? Because I'm, if we don't get that, this is the most. It must be so settled in our hearts, so strengthened in our hearts, that if they may take away all kinds of other stuff from us, but if they take away the, that Jesus is 
the only begotten of the Father and his God in the flesh, where God was manifest in the flesh, that Jesus is God incarnate, then we have nothing more than another prophet. Another person. Another plan. But our plan is a person. And the person in our plan is, is God himself. And he is the supplying God. Not only is he the sovereign God, but he is the supplying God. The word was God. In chapter 10, in verse number 9, I am the door by me if any man enter in, he shall be saved. And he shall go in and find, out and find pasture. He supplies salvation and he supplies our sustenance. You'll notice that. If you come in, you'll be saved. You can go in and out and find pasture. Salvation and sustenance. We know in chapter 14, verse number 6, Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. He is the supplier of salvation. For God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. When did he become salvation? When God was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. Glory is the only God and Father full of grace and truth. And that God that was made flesh full of grace and truth was the Son of God that laid down his life for his sheep. I'm trying to get us to comprehend one simple thing. He is God. The God of salvation. The God of our sustenance. In chapter 15, I believe it is, in verse number 5, he says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him. The same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. How do you bring forth fruit if you do not get nourished? No, you can't. Very good answer, Brother Paul. So he says, I supply what you need to produce what I want. I supply what you need to produce what I want. I want fruit. I'll supply what you need. Now let me ask you this question in that case. If he supplies it, why aren't we producing it? Fair question. And the problem's not him. The problem's not him. And uh, so, and then we find in chapter 6, verses 32 through 35, he makes this statement this way. He said, Then said Jesus unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not the bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth unto the world, and, he, and giveth life unto the world. And they said, then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I, I, I want us to grasp a hold of this. Grab a hold of this. Get a hold of this. It's him. He is God. And he is the supplying God. He supplies our salvation. He supplies our sustenance that we might survive and that we might produce more Free. You ever need more grace? Y'all ever not, none of y'all ever did. He gives more grace to the humble. Right. You ever needed more mercy? You can go to the throne of grace and obtain mercy. His mercies are new every morning. You ever needed more strength? It's God that girds me with strength and makes my way perfect. You ever need more? He's more than what you ask for. He does exceed abundantly above all we can ask for things. I'm not trying to preach, I'm trying to teach, but glory hallelujah, how can you not get happy when you think about he is the witness in the beginning. The awareness, he was with God. 
and the hoodness. He is God. He is the word of revelation. Then he's the word of regeneration. Verse number four. He makes it this way. In him was life and the life was the light of men. No other place of life other than him. Physical life, God breathed into man the breath of life. God made man. Gave man life. Physical life. God breathes into us life. How did we get life? Physical and it is God and, and spiritual. Life. It's the only way of life. He holds your breath in his hand. Oh, 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 I got happy the other day. You know? No steps, no stories. That's what their, their theme was. And uh, Miss Pat, I was just thinking, I said, Brother Jerry's in pretty bad shape. Looks like he's recovering, but slowly, and it's a long road ahead. But, uh, Brother Jerry was not out golfing when he tripped. He was out giving out the gospel when he tripped. And so they decided if, they were, if you, you, you make steps forward for God, you'll end up with stories to tell about. Let me tell you how, how this guy went on. Let me tell you about how Paul walked with God. And guess what? He was he got his head chopped off. You won't have a story if you never take steps for God. Jerry, Brother Jerry can get up and sell folks maybe in, in, in a few in a few months. Say, oh, oh, it was a rough road going through that hospital stuff. But let me tell you this. Oh, I was out getting the gospel out. And when we, when we tell him that, he was getting the gospel out. He wasn't laying around slumbering and sleeping. He was doing something for God. And guess what? God honors that. He made some steps, and now he's got another story. And we'll be able to tell it for years about it. I'll be able to testify to people when, I, when I'm telling them, listen, you think you can't do anything? Let me tell you about a man. He wasn't a youngster anymore. He had some heart surgeries. He had some issues, physical issues. But he's out doing something for God. And let me tell you about how God reminds us that people, even older people in their later years, can do something for God. And yet, he does it in his later years. We just don't do it because we're in our lazy years. Amen. That's my message. Amen. It's a, oh, yeah. You say, I'm doing something. Do more. Amen. I can do more. You can do more. We all can do more. Let Brother Jerry be an example. We can do more. Amen. I'm preaching that now. That's, that's done with that one. Okay. But he's, he, the word, he's the word. Christ is the word of regeneration. He's the power for regeneration. The power for regeneration. But as many as received him, to them gave the power to become the sons of God. Verse number 12 of chapter 1. He is the provider of first regeneration, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. He is it. He's the word of regeneration. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You don't get saved by a plan. You get saved by a person. Just happens to be the person had a plan. But if you miss the person and you see the cross without the Christ, you missed everything. You missed everything. And let me say, if you see the person with the cross, or the cross with the Christ, he'll become everything. 
And guess what? That means he is the proof of regeneration. I've still got more to go and I'm not going to get to it. Oh, but he is the word for reception. I'll give it to you in just a minute. But I, I, want to, I want you to see this. He is the proof of regeneration. The book of 1 John, chapter 1, he makes this statement. No, verse chapter 5. I was thinking, for, for who, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. If there is no victory in your Christian life, it is because you have not life. He is the one that overcometh the world. Now, did I say if there is no struggle in your Christian life, you have no Christian life? I did not say that. But if there is no victory, then there is no life. Death is swallowed up in victory. We have victory in Jesus. And because we have victory in Jesus, we have victory in by Jesus. For it's him which works in us both the will and the do of his good pleasure. He's a word of regeneration. So therefore leaving him to be the word for reception. The word for reception. Chapter 20, verse number 31. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus Christ is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. He is the word for reception. If you do not receive him, you do not have life. You can believe on all that he did, but if you do not believe on him who is the one who did it all. Trusting in him. You do not have life. One of the biggest problems I found in young Christians so called. Is they let them to get to the cross. But they never get them to see Christ. And how should they believe on him. And whom they have not heard. They've heard of the cross. And of a Jesus that died on the cross. But Jesus is the Son of God. The Most High God. That has been from everlasting to everlasting. That created the cross that he was crucified on. He created the tree. That that cross was made out of. So he created the cross that he was crucified on. He tells us that and in chapter 10, verse number 10. The thief comes not but to steal and to kill and destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Again, chapter 20, verse 31. But these are, they, these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Not that he's just a man who hung on a tree for your sins, but he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He is a person, the God in the flesh, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Dear one, I just want you to see how important it is to see him as who he is. He's always been, he'll always be the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, if he was everything to you yesterday, when life was glorious, when you were living in glory, he could be everything to you today, even if life gets glory. If he, could, if he was everything to you, in the day of salvation, 
My friends in North Carolina, South Carolina, East, Far East Tennessee, and Northeast Georgia, he is everything to you, can be everything to you in the storm. He is. He is. He is. In the beginning was the word. The expression of God's heart. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What comes out of the mouth? The word. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Don't let it go. Don't let it go. Let it settle in your heart. Let it strengthen your heart. Establish, strengthen, and settle in your heart. Oh, my friend, even if you suffer for a while, let it establish, strengthen, and settle in you. He is that I am. For I am that I am. Father, I pray and help us in this simple truth. That is such a spectacular truth and a special truth. God, do a work in our hearts that we might receive it and rely upon it and respond to this truth. That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. My Jesus, I